Hoping, there it is. Uh, so we are live streaming this morning. Um, uh, that doesn't mean the cameras will be on you all the time. The cameras sort of pan the audience and they aim this way. But uh, there are folks that do join us. You got the link yesterday. If you want to forward that link to somebody that we sent out yesterday um, from, our, from our Richmond Church of Christ YouTube page, they can, they can join us if they can't be here physically today. We actually have folks who will join us uh, from other countries, so pretty exciting uh, when that happens. I do want to go over these prayer requests, and if you'd bow with me, um, we'll open this morning with prayer requests. Our Father in heaven, it's great to be here this morning uh, on a uh, beautiful fall morning. Thank you for every soul that is here today. Thank you for everyone who has worked so hard to put this on. Thank you for Chuck uh, coming our way to, to be able to be with us here in Richmond, Kentucky. Father, we have these names and and people that we want to lift up to you. Um, Already, Father, this morning, uh, one of the prayer requests, and it it hits hard right off, that um, we know, Father, that none of us are perfect, but, Father, every one of us is precious. And here is a person who has a friend with suicidal thoughts. Father, we know that is more common today, and uh, we just... Put that in your hands, God, that uh, you'll help everyone realize that how precious we are and that suicide is, is not an answer. Father, we, uh, another one is uh, a prayer lifted up that a person has neighbors who are inappropriate and mean, uh, lots of drama, lots of jealousy. And God, we know that you can have a healing hand and we just pray that this person can be, always be a good example uh, to their neighbors, and that, Father, the, the neighbors would uh, come to know you. Father, also, um, a person here uh, wants to lift up a, a family who has um, a, a good friends but, but are unfaithful, and she would love to see them come back to you. And, Father, uh, Sarah uh, uh, put this request in, and uh, she just listed very ill. And we know that you know what that means, Father. Thank you so much for hearing our prayers. Thank you, Father, for speaking to us through your word. Thank you for your son and thank you for your spirit. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Chuck South comes to us from uh, those who did not, were not here last night from Summerdale. I got that right. Summerdale, Alabama. If you don't know where that's at, drive all the way till you run into the ocean and you're pretty close to where he's from. He has come all the way up here to be with us this weekend as we open our topic, uh, as we are into our second topic. So if you have your books this morning, if you'd uh, go ahead and flip over in your books, that way you can take some notes with that nice pen that you have. And uh, Chuck will uh, take it from there. Chuck, uh, thank you for joining us this morning and the, uh, the floor is yours. Okay. Oh, I, I can hear it. Okay. All right. Good morning, guys. Oh, man. Some of you guys, you sound so tired. I know how it gets at these things. Uh, I heard one kid say this morning that he was up till 3 o'clock. I have a feeling that some of you probably beat that. Is anybody up past 3 o'clock this morning? Okay. All right. A couple of people. All right. Some of you look really tired. Some of you don't. Some of you look like you're so excited to be here. Um, now, look, I know that the reason that all of you are here this weekend is because you wanted to come and learn and you wanted to come and worship together and there is no other reason that you would be here this weekend. Uh, Look, I'm I'm not stupid. I know that's not really why a lot of you are here. I remember being your age and coming to things like this and while I did get a lot out of the worship and I I did learn a lot from the the lessons and everything, that was not really the reason that I came. (laughs) Uh, I know that for a lot of you, the reason you are here, if you're a boy... You, were, you probably came because there are going to be girls there. I know it. And I know some of them. And some of them I want to know. And if you're girls, some of you are like, I know there are going to be boys there. Some of them are going to smell really bad. But not all of them will. And maybe I'll meet one that doesn't. Uh, so I know that that's why a lot of you came this weekend. You know what? That's fine. I'm just glad that you're here. I'm really excited to be here with you. Uh, last night, in all of the excitement with the snake, we remember the snake last night. That was crazy, right? 
uh, I forgot to read the theme verse for the weekend. Okay, so I know this is the commit youth rally, but you, you know, the theme is ignite, right? But the theme verse for the weekend is 1 Corinthians 13, 13. So now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, but the greatest of these is love. Okay. I meant to read that last night with the excitement of the snake. I just completely forgot. Um, so last night, what did we talk about? Those of you that were there at the campfire, what did we talk about? Yeah. We talked about faith, right? And as far as it relates to starting a fire, which part of the fire was faith? Hmm? Close. It was the heat, right? It was the heat. It was, uh, you know, you have the fuel and you have the oxygen, but the faith was the heat part of that, okay? It's the, it's, uh, the part that ignites it. You've got to have the fuel and you've got to have the oxygen, but you've got to have a source of heat, and that was the faith, okay? This morning we're going to talk about hope. Uh, and like faith, I think that hope is one of those things that we misunderstand a little bit sometimes. I don't like ambiguity. Do you know what an ambiguity is? Anybody? When something is ambiguous, what does that mean? Anybody? Uh, who said unclear? Who said it? Somebody over here. Someone said unclear. That's right. And ambiguity means that something is unclear. Uh, I, am, I, I am a youth minister. That's what I do full-time. But I'm also in law school full-time, which is a nightmare. Okay? So you're thinking, I want to be a lawyer someday. Maybe you do, and that's fine. I hope you like to read a lot. A lot. I hope you like to read a lot of things that are not exciting at all. Because that's what it's like going to law school. Okay? Uh, and one of the big things when, we're, when I'm reading through these cases and stuff is often there's an ambiguity that the whole case turns on. It's this one word that can mean multiple things, and that's what everybody is arguing about. That's what the whole case kind of hinges on is maybe one or two words or a phrase that can mean different things. I don't like ambiguities. I don't like them. I want, if, if someone says a word, I want it to mean like one thing. There's something exciting about a word that can be ambiguous because it can mean something to you. It can mean something to me. And there are a lot of things in life that are like that. But when it comes to defining things, when it comes to defining things that relate to God, I like for things to be nailed down. I like, for thing, I like to know exactly what it is that I'm reading. I like to know what it is that I'm talking about. But, you know, sometimes it's just not quite that easy. And I think hope can be one of those things. When I was in college, I was actually talking to Alex about this uh, earlier. We were talking about uh, our, our days of playing soccer in college. I played soccer at Freed Hardeman. Uh, you know, a, I had a lot of hair then. Uh, I was also about 30 pounds lighter. Um, but I, I miss it. I loved playing soccer. I had not played soccer as long as the other guys had on this team. I played like second through sixth grade, and then my high school had a team my senior year. So from sixth grade to my senior year, I did not play soccer. But I loved it. These guys I was playing on this team with the Freed Hardeman had played their whole lives. They were a lot better than I was. Um, but I, I loved going to practice. I loved the idea of getting better in the hopes that if I got better and I showed the coach that I was determined and I could, I could do what he needed me to do, that I would get time on the field. The bad part about that was I was the backup for a guy who was absolutely incredible. Our uh, freshman year, we came in together as freshmen. He scored 36 goals in 18 games. It was insane. He was ridiculous, just absolutely ridiculous. But he also got hurt a lot, and I'm using, you know, my you know, my finger quotes there, because when he got hurt, he didn't really get hurt. He was just a really big baby sometimes. So I got to go in when he got hurt. Uh, I was still nowhere near as good as he was, and there was no way I was ever going to be. He was just an incredible talent. But I would still work really hard in practice because I would hope that it would get on the field. Um, you know, that's, that's sort of trivial, I guess, right? There, there are things that we hope for, things that, you know, we, we sort of desire to happen, things that maybe we even know are going to happen, we still hope for. And they can be kind of trivial, right? What's happening at the end of next month? Christmas. Oh, we're whispering like it's a secret. And we all know it's Christmas, okay? Yeah, it's Christmas, right? Christmas, I, I love, oh my goodness, I love Christmas. I love everything about Christmas. I love Christmas music, but not until at least like the week of Thanksgiving. You know, I've got to restrain myself a little bit. I love Christmas music. I love Christmas movies, even the super, super cheesy ones. I love them. I love a Christmas tree. My wife taught me into getting an artificial tree, and part of my soul died when we did it. I love a real tree, but we have an artificial one now. Uh, it's fine, whatever. Uh, I love Christmas. I love things that taste like Christmas. You know, lots of cinnamon. You, you know, I don't like eggnog. That's disgusting. I like, anybody here know what boiled custard is? Oh, yeah. See, that's, that's like what, what eggnog wishes it could be. That's, boiled custard is amazing. Eggnog is gross, and you people that like it are just gross. Um, I love Christmas. I can't wait for Christmas. You remember what it's like 
you know, and I know you probably still, you know, you still hope for things for Christmas, but you know, you're, you're trying to play it cool. You, know, you don't want to be too excited. You don't want mom and dad to think that uh, you know, you're being too eager. So you're like, yeah, I'd like this for Christmas. But really inside, you're like, please get this for me. Please get this for me. Please get this for me. And like, you're waiting for it. And, you know, Christmas comes around. My family, we open presents Christmas Eve. Santa Claus comes Christmas morning. And you hope that at one of those moments, you're going to get the thing that you've been hoping for. Well, I still hope for Christmas that way. You know, that's still kind of trivial, right? On my way up here, uh, which, you know, was a long time to think about it. Uh, I was really hoping that my hotel would be near a Culver's. See, we don't have a Culver's, well, anywhere near where I've ever lived. <laughs> uh, and I've lived in a lot of places. Uh, Culver's is really, I guess it's, it's mostly like a Midwestern thing. It's kind of where it started, I guess. Uh, oh, man, a butter burger. I know it's bad for me. I know it's so bad, but it's so good, right? It's just so delicious. So I got here. It was late, but, man, I went to get a butter burger. It was so good. I was hoping for it, and man, there it was. Uh, you know, I got to my hotel. I checked my app, and there's one like half a mile away. I'm like, oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, my, I was hoping for it, and it happened. Sometimes the things that we hope for are kind of serious, though, right? I know you guys can't see it, but the socks that I'm wearing have little ladybugs on them. Okay, that's weird, right? I get it. It's fine. Whatever. Uh, I have two kids, like, like I said last night. For those of you that weren't here, I have two sons. Been in for Duke basketball players. I know it's dangerous to admit that here. It's fine, whatever. But my youngest, Shire, uh, he bought those for me uh, a couple of years ago when he was four, and he thought it would be absolutely hilarious. It's like, Dad's going to wear socks with ladybugs on them. <laughs> yeah, I am going to wear them. Okay, I'm going to wear them like all the time. And I love them because when I wear them, they remind me of him. Uh, he is hilarious. He's crazy, but he's also really sweet sometimes. He did not buy these socks for me to be sweet. He bought them because oh, Dad's a grown man wearing ladybug socks. It's fine. Um, <laughs> Before Shire uh, was born, uh, when my wife Bethany was, was pregnant with Shire, we went in. Uh, my wife has uh, a lot of health problems with her back, and so we had to go. To, I can't remember. It's like a high-risk doctor. I, I can't remember what it was called, but um, they had to do a lot of extra things uh, for her uh, when she was pregnant with Shire. And one of the scans they did, they found something on his brain. And, man, that was scary. You know, we had this meeting with the doctor. He tells us, uh, you know, if it is what we think it is, you know, this could be really bad. Um, he could have something, it would end up, uh, I mean, he would have something called microcephaly, which means his head does not form the way it should. His end, head ends up being a lot smaller than it should. And kids that have that don't live very long. And the lives they do have, uh, there's not much quality of life. It was scary. We were thinking, well, this, you know, this is uh, not what we expected. Because those of you that are parents in here, for your kids, they're really, when it comes down to it, there are two things that you want for your kids, right? You want them to be healthy, and you want them to be Christians. Like that's, you know, and everything else kind of, can fall into those two categories. Well, right off the bat, we're being told that our kid may not be healthy. That was scary. That was scary. So we prayed about it and hoped and hoped and hoped that the next time we went in, whatever it was wouldn't be there. And it wasn't. The next time we went in, like the, the scan that they showed, it was just sort of anom- some anomaly that had showed up uh, on the scan before. But man, even when we were hoping that it would go away, there was still this big part of me that was scared that it wasn't going to go away. And I think that it was because I was misunderstanding what hope really is. I didn't really quite have a grasp on what hope is and what it does for us. So I think sometimes we get hope and apprehension and nervousness and worry kind of mixed up. And they come together in this this weird thing that makes us feel kind of weird when things are coming up. Like we hope that something good is going to happen. At the same time, we're afraid something bad is going to happen. And we're nervous that what we hope for is not really going to happen the way we want it to. But the Bible tells us that hope is different from that. Um, and, you know, this is one of those things that for me was hard to, to get a grasp on it because I think what I thought hope was for so long really wasn't what God's definition of hope is. Do you know what hope means? Do you know what it is? Anybody? If you could say, if, if I were to ask you, what does hope mean? What would you tell me? Anybody? Yeah. A way to cope with certain things. A way to cope with certain things? Okay, yeah. I can definitely do that. Anybody else? Yeah. To really want something to happen. Ah, I think we're getting there. That's good. To really want something to happen. It's, yeah. Oh, you're cheating. All right. Confident expectancy. I really like that. That is, that is so good. Confident expectancy. That's even better than what I had. What I had was an expectation or desire that something will happen, that something desired will happen. Confident expectancy, man, that's so good. Okay, a confident, a 
expectancies. See, that's different from the way we use the word hope sometimes. The way we use the word hope is, I want it to happen, but I also know it might not happen. Man. Well, let's, you know, let's see what God has to say about this. Uh, let's look. Let's look at Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. This is sort of the quintessential passage on hope in the Bible. I, I love the way that Paul talks about it here. Romans chapter 8. We're going to start reading verse 18. Romans chapter 8, starting verse 18. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. We wait for it with patience. He says hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? Let's go back to this idea of Christmas, right? You're, there are some things that you want for Christmas. You've probably, some of you have been dropping some subtle hints to your parents. Some of you not so subtle hints, right? So you just come out, come right out and say it. Some of you, you know, you like to play mind games with your parents, make them think it's their idea. That's pretty smart. If you can do that, man, that's good, okay? Make them think it's their idea to get it for you. That's pretty, that's pretty slick. But let's say that you get it. You open up that gift and it's in your hands. Do you hope that you get it anymore? Are you still hoping that you're going to get that present? This is an easy one. This is, you know, this is like a slow pitch kickball question that I'm tossing you here. Okay? If you have that gift in your hands, do you still hope that you're going to get it? No, why not? You have it. It's in your hands. You can see it. You can hold it. You have it. It belongs to you. You don't hope for it anymore. It's something that you already have. You hope for things that have not yet happened. So what is it that we're hoping for? What is, what is it that this hope does for us? When we're talking about this fire that we're building this ignition process. Last night, faith was the heat and hope. If you get your little booklet, you can see it. Hope is the fuel. fuel. Hope is confident and What was it you said that hope was? What did you say it was? A way to cope with things. I mean, hope really is a fuel, right? Hope keeps people going. Uh, my, my degree in college was in history. I love history. I love uh, all kinds of history. I'm really... Uh, specifically, I, I really love uh, stuff about World War II. I love uh, European history. Man, reading stories about people that were in concentration camps and the way that they coped with the horrible conditions they had to live with, it was hope. It was hope that kept them going all the time because they, they just kept hoping that they were going to get out, that something was going to happen and they were going to get out. For a lot of them, though, it wasn't so much that they wanted something to happen the only way they were able to survive is telling themselves that something good was going to happen. This hope that sustained them, that kept them going, they knew it was going to come. They just had to keep themselves going until then. And that's what hope does for us. Hope keeps us going when things get incredibly difficult. Hope is what keeps us, I mean, it's, it's what keeps us alive as Christians. What Paul says here when he says, but if we hope, for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Okay. Well, as a Christian, I already belong to God. I belong to Jesus. I've been saved because of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because I believe in Him. Because I know that without Him I am lost. Because I was baptized into His resurrection, into His blood. I have become a Christian, I know that I am saved. So what is it now that I am hoping for? If you're already Christian, what is it that you're hoping for? Somebody said it. Heaven, right? We're hoping for heaven. And it's not so much that, man, I really hope it happens. I really want it to happen. I don't know if it's going to, but I really, you know, I want it to. No, no, no. Heaven is going to happen, but I can't see it yet. I can't see it yet. I know that it's there. I know that God has it waiting for me. 
And so this hope is a little bit different. It's not like um, it might happen, it might not happen. I know it's going to happen. It's something that I am waiting for with patience. I know that God is going to come one day and he's going to take me home. And so my hope is something a little bit different from the way the world uses the word hope. It's something that sustains me when things get difficult. Let's look at uh, Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2. Jesus offers one of the churches here uh, some hope. Revelation chapter 2. Revelation 2, starting in verse 8. To the angel of the church in Smyrna write the words of the first and the last who died and came to life. I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich. And the slander of those who say that they are Jews and are not, but are synagogue of Satan. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested. And for ten days you will have tribulation. Man, that doesn't sound very good, right? He starts off by saying, don't fear what you're about to suffer. So he's already told them, you're going to suffer. And he's told them that they're going to be thrown into jail. They're going to have tribulation. Then he says, be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. He says, yeah, look, it's going to get bad. Things are going to be hard. But you can get through it because I have a promise for you. I have something waiting for you. I have a crown of life waiting for you after you are done with this tribulation. Now, when we talk about persecution, for us, man, it's so different from what people had to deal with in the first century, what people around the world have had to deal with as far as persecution goes. Our persecution is people talking bad about us. People, people maybe they don't invite us to things. It's not really quite persecution. It's uncomfortable, yes, but it's not really persecution. Still, there are going to be a lot of tough things you've got to deal with in your life if you wear the name of Christ. Well, how do you get through it? How do you get through those tough times? How is it that you get through temptation? How do you keep yourself afloat in a world that wants you to drown? Well, it's hope. And that hope is that there is something waiting for you that God has promised for you. It's something that you can't see yet, but he tells you that it's there. You remember what Jesus told his followers when he said he was leaving, when he said he had to go? He said, I go to prepare a place for you. Jesus was here, yes, but he left to prepare a place for us. There's a place waiting for us in heaven. And that's what it is that we hope for. Okay? It's not something that we're wondering if it's going to happen or not. We know it's going to happen, but we hope. We wait for it with patience. We know it's going to happen, so we wait for it with patience. I want to go to the Old Testament now. We're going to go to Joshua chapter 7. This is probably, uh, as far as the Old Testament goes, this is probably my favorite, uh, my favorite story of hope because it spans generations. Um, it starts in Joshua, but it finishes, or it ends up somewhere else. Joshua chapter 7. Prior to Joshua chapter 7, uh, in the chapters before Joshua chapter 7, specifically in chapter 6, do you know what happened? What big thing happened in Joshua chapter 6? You probably got a little heading in your Bible that says it right above chapter 6, maybe. Hmm? Jericho, the fall of Jericho, right? The defeat of this great city, the crumbling of this great city. What was the one thing? After the fall of the city, the people were not supposed to do. You know, there was something they were not supposed to do after Jericho was defeated. Hmm? They weren't supposed to loot the city. They weren't supposed to go in and take something. That's right. They were not supposed to go in and take things, which would be tempting, right? I mean, you've been marching around the city, this great city. You know they've got a lot of good stuff in there. And they says, no, no, no. You cannot go in there. You cannot take anything. Don't do it. But somebody does. Somebody does. Joshua chapter 7. Now, before we get to who actually did it, something else happened between the defeat of Jericho and their discovery that someone has taken something from Jericho. Do you know, you know what happened? The beginning of chapter 7? Verse 1. But the people of Israel broke faith in regard to the devoted things. For Achan, the son of Carmi, son of Zabdi, son of Zerah, some fun names there, the tribe of Judah took some of the devoted things, and the anger of the Lord burned against the people of Israel. Now, God knows who it is at this point. The other people, others, they, you know, they're not sure. They just know, you know, they don't really know that anything's been taken yet. Verse 2, Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is near Bethaven, east of Bethel, and said to them, go up and spy out the land. And the men went up and spied out Ai, and they returned to Joshua and said to him, do not have all the people go up, but let about two or three thousand men go up and attack Ai. 
Do not make the whole people toil up there, for they are few. So what his spies say, hey, look, this, this place, it's really not worth us sending our whole army. Let's just send two or 3,000 people. They'll take care of it. It's fine. They're, they're a small people. No problem. And Joshua's like, oh, okay, all right, that's fine. We'll just send, send a few people. So about 3,000 men went up from there, from the people, and they fled before the men of Ai. And the men of Ai killed about 36 of their men and chased them before the gate as far as Shebarim and struck them at the descent. And the hearts of the people melted and became as water. They were afraid. They were terrified. This small group of people that should have been able to easily defeat, they are chased away. Well, that didn't go as planned. They have just taken, you know, they've just taken this huge, great city of Jericho just by marching around it. Now they're going, they're going to go into battle against a small group of people and they get defeated. Man, something has gone wrong here. Something is not adding up. This is not the way things are supposed to happen. Verse 10, the Lord said to Joshua, get up. Why have you fallen on your face? Israel has sinned. They have transgressed my covenant that I commanded them. They've taken some of the devoted things. They've stolen and lied and put them among their own belongings. Okay, so after this, they decide they're going to find out, okay, who, who took these things? Who is it that took these things? So they, are, they decide they're going to bring all the people before them. They're going to ask them, okay, did you take it? Did you take it? Did you take it? Verse 16, so Joshua rose early in the morning and brought, brought Israel near tribe by tribe. And the tribe of Judah was taken. And he brought near the clans of Judah, and the clan of the Zerahites was taken. He brought near the clan of the Zerahites man by man, and Zabdi was taken. He brought near his household man by man, and Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, the tribe of Judah, was taken. Then Joshua said to Achan, My son, give glory to the God of Israel and give praise to him. And tell me now what you have done. Do not hide it from me. And Achan answered Joshua, Truly, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel, and this is what I did. When I saw among the spoil a beautiful cloak for Shinar, and two hundred shekels of silver, and a bar of gold weighing fifty shekels, then I coveted them and took them, and see there hidden the earth inside my tent, with the silver underneath. So he took these things, and he hid them, and now everybody knows why they were defeated by this little small force that they should have taken easily. Because Achan, one man, saw something that he wanted that he knew was not his, and he took it and he hid it. Look, what happens next is pretty dark. Uh, it's pretty sad. Verse 22, So Joshua sent messengers, and they ran to the tent, and behold, it was hidden in his tent with the silver underneath. They took him out of the tent and brought them to Joshua and to all the people of Israel. And they laid them down before the Lord, and Joshua and all Israel with him took Achan, the son of Zerah, and the silver and the cloak and the bar of gold, and his sons and daughters and his oxen and donkeys and sheep and his tent and all that he had. And they brought them up to the valley of Achor. Man, this does not sound good so far, right? Yeah, they're taking Achan who committed the sin and caused this, the loss of this battle, the death of 36 men. But Achan's not the only one that's about to be punished, is he? We've got a bunch of animals. Okay, yeah, it's fine, whatever. But it's also his sons and his daughters. They take him to this place called the Valley of Achor. That's going to come up later. Remember that name, the Valley of Achor. And Joshua said, why did you bring trouble on us? The Lord brings trouble on you today. And all Israel stoned him with stones. They burned them with fire and stoned them with stones. Who is them? It's not just Achan, is it? It's Achan and his family paying the price for Achan's sin in this place called the Valley of Achor. They are stoned with stones, and then they are burned. And they raised over him a great heap of stones that remains to this day. And the Lord turned from his burning anger. Therefore, to this day, the name of that place is called the Valley of Achor. Does anybody know what the word Achor means? Trouble. trouble. The Valley of Achor. What it means is the Valley of Trouble. Man, that's a good name, right? Think about this dark thing that has happened here. Yes, these men went into battle and they lost, but all, these, all the people, they, had, they watched. Whether they were directly involved or not, they watched as Achan and his family were killed in this valley. Now, Achan sinned. Achan's paying the price for his sin. But is Achan the only one paying the price for his sin? No. No. Achan's sin 
causes other people to pray, pay the price as well in this place called the Valley of Achor. Now, we're going to jump forward here into the book of Hosea. We're going to look at Hosea chapter 2. Hosea is a very interesting book. I don't know if you've read a lot from it. God chooses a very interesting way of showing his love for Israel in the book of Hosea. It's pretty cool. We're not going to spend a lot of time in Hosea, though. We're going to just look at a few verses here. Hosea chapter 2, starting in verse 14. I'm sorry, not verse 14. We're going to start in verse 21. Hosea chapter 2, starting in verse 21. And in that day I will answer, declares the Lord. I will answer the heavens. They shall answer the earth, and the earth shall answer the grain, the wine, and the oil. They shall answer Jezreel, and I will show, I will sow her for myself in the land. And I will have mercy on no mercy. And I will say to not my people, you are my people. And he shall say, you are my God. Now God is, he's, he's talking about something. He's talking about redeeming his people. He's talking about bringing something back to him that has gone away over and over and over again. Now we're going to back up into verse 14. Therefore, behold, I will allure her and bring her into the wilderness and speak tenderly to her. And there I will give her her vineyards and make the valley of Achor a door of hope. And there she shall answer as in the days of her youth, as at the time when she came out of the land of Egypt. When God says her, who is he talking about? The nation of Israel. He's talking about his people. But look at what he says here. He says he's going to make the valley of Achor a door of hope. And once you think about uh, the Hebrew people at this time uh, and the way that they passed down their history, this is very much a, a people that was very concerned with their history. Think about the book of Matthew. Okay, the first chapter of the book of Matthew is what genealogy. What audience was the book of Matthew written to specifically? Who said it? Written to the Jewish people. And he gives them a genealogy at the very beginning because that's important to them as people. It's important for them to know where they came from. That's a big part of who they are. Do you think these people passed down this story of the Valley of Achor? Do you think that people who were not alive at the time of Achan's sin and the death of his family, do you think they passed that story down to their children? Absolutely. Absolutely they did. That was a big part of who they were. They had just won this huge battle, this huge battle at Jericho. And they lost this tiny little battle against Ai. And Achan pays the price because of his sin. And his family pays the price because of his sin. This is a story that they absolutely were going to pass down to the generations to their children. And so when God says, I'm going to make the valley of Achor, this valley of trouble, this thing that is associated with death and darkness, I'm going to take that and I'm going to change it into a door of hope. And that is so beautiful to me because you know what? That's exactly what God does for me. It's what God does for you. It's what he does for us over and over again. I think one of the things that really gets in the way of our hope, of heaven, this thing that we are waiting for with patience, this thing we know that God's prepared for us, this thing that we are just, we, it's so hard for us to think about waiting, but still we wait with patience because we know it's going to happen on God's time. Something interferes with that hope sometimes. It's our sin. It's our past. It's the things that we have done that we think are going to keep us out of heaven. And you know what God does with our past, with our sins, with our mistakes? When we come to him, when we say to him that we don't want to live in that past anymore, we don't want to live in that sin anymore, we want to live in the hope that he has provided, you know what he does? He takes our valley of trouble. He takes our valley of sin and temptation, and he transformed it into something beautiful. He transforms it into a door of hope, something that we can walk through and everything changes. Where, uh, where's Josh? Where's Josh? Is he in here? All right. He's out there. Okay. I didn't talk to him before. I don't know if we're doing an invitation or not. If he comes in here, we're going to do one. <laughs> um, look, I don't know well, oh, well, there he is. Hey, hey, Josh, do you have an invitation song? Do you have an invitation song? Okay, all right. Um, I don't know what it is that you're 
hoping for right now. Maybe your mind is not quite here. Maybe you're thinking about other things. Maybe something's happening later this week that you can't wait for. Maybe something's happening later this month or next year that you can't wait for. And that's kind of where your mind is. But I want you to bring it back here for just a moment. I want you to think about the hope that we have in heaven. I want you to think about the hope that Jesus provides. Maybe you can't even think about hope right now. Maybe for you, hope is something that seems so foreign because all you can think about is your past. All you think about is your sin. And you say, there is no way that God is going to open a door of hope for me because my past is so awful, because my past is so dark. God, for, the, for his people, he says, I'm going to take that valley of trouble, that, that thing that is so dark in your past, and I'm going to change it into something beautiful. I'm going to create this door of hope that you can walk through where everything is going to change. You know, in Romans chapter 8, we, we read about hope. We read about waiting for something with patience. We read about this hope that saves us. Well, what hope is it that saves us? Yeah, we hope for heaven, but what is it exactly that saves us? Well, you know what it is, and most of you can probably quote it, right? John three sixteen. See, that's our hope. That's our hope. Do you know who Jesus was talking to uh, here in John chapter 3? And we know, we know John 3.16, we can quote it, but you know who he was talking to when he said it? Anybody? Nobody knows? He's talking to, who said it? Nicodemus? He's having this discussion with Nicodemus, right? He's, he's trying to explain to him what it means to be born again, and then he gives him John 3.16. He says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Guys, that is the hope that saves us. See, without Jesus, we're still in that valley of Achor. We're still in that valley of trouble because we are lost in our sins. We are lost in our past, in our darkness. But when Jesus came, when God sent his only son here to die for us, that valley of trouble became this beautiful door of hope that he has opened for us, that we can walk through, and everything changes. And everything changes. It's no longer... I don't know what's going to happen to me when I die. I don't know what's waiting for me in eternity. I don't really know what's going to happen to me, to my soul, when my body dies. It doesn't have to be this scary thing. It can be this thing that you wait for with patience. It can be this thing that you are so hopeful for because you know how beautiful it is. You can't see it with your eyes, but you know that it is there. So you wait for it with patience. Last night we were talking about faith, and we said that faith is the evidence of... It's it's something that you hope for, but it's also the conviction of things not seen the conviction of things not seen well if you have that faith in god if you if you have that heat source to start that fire well the next thing you add is the fuel to that fire the thing that keeps it going the thing that yeah maybe you have to add some more to it from time to time but when you add the fuel the fire grows and it grows but let's add that fuel this morning let's add that hope that You know, when he says that faith is the conviction of things not seen, look, I can't see heaven. I know that John describes it, and it sounds pretty awesome, but I can't really see it with my eyes. But I know that it's there. So the hope that I have for heaven, it's not... It's not this question of whether or not it's it's actually going to happen. It's more of a waiting for it with patience kind of hope. This morning... I don't know where you are in your relationship with God, but I know that he does. I know that he does, and I know that if you're not where you need to be, I know that he's waiting for you with open arms. He wants you to walk through that door of hope that he has created for you. Maybe you already walked through that door of hope a long time ago, but you've allowed Satan to control your thoughts about your past and your sin, and maybe you've allowed yourself to almost be drawn back into that valley of trouble. I know that's not where God wants you to be. He's given you hope because he wants it to sustain you. He wants you to have that confident expectancy that something good is coming. Something beautiful is waiting for you when this life is over. Yes, this is no. Do you know that God had created that door of hope for you? Do you know that? He wants you to walk through it. I know that He does. I don't know what it is that you need, but I know that God does. So please, won't you come while together we sing?
Chris. I'm going to be on this one. Can you, can you pull up my slide bank, if you would? Okay, uh, first item for you all, as they're getting ready to pull up my slides here. Um, on the social media, you all probably figured this out. There's that thing for the remind. Uh, you'll get a remind text here about 1010, which tells us where we're going for our first session and how the, all that's working. And you'll get some of those throughout the day. Okay, what else we got? Uh, go ahead and tweet. Anything you can do to help us promote this, it is wonderful. We appreciate it. Uh, how many of you all by t this morning now have found that new Snapchat filter we created while you're here? Go ahead and hold your hands up. Yeah, it's fun. We can use the Internet for the good, so that's why we want to do that. Brett Clark, thank you for creating that Snapchat filter. Booklets. If you all have not gotten your booklets, uh, we do have those here. I did find one back here. Kinley, I found your booklet. Where's Kinley? There we go. <laughs> How about that? She's so embarrassed. Everybody wave at Kinley. Say hi, Kinley. Thank you. Uh, booklets, pins, T-shirts. If you don't have all that stuff, see Miss Stephanie. Uh, we're going to be... Uh, also, we have a, a list of these things, all the different sites. The YouTube site's important uh, for later because when you want to go back, we're going to have a, a playlist up there so you can go back and, and watch whether it's the singing sessions or the speaking sessions. We'll trim all that and make it all look nice and, and put all those up there. Uh, what else we got? In case of emergency, while you're here, uh, if it is severe weather, duck. Uh, and in all seriousness, we would go into the hallway and that we would go into the classrooms closest to us there and um, in, in case of emergency, you'd be directed where to go. In case of fire, get out of the building, go outside. Uh, you all have found the, the, the bathrooms. The one that uh, sadly enough that we've added this year is in case of, of an active shooter. Um, if you had something like that, um, what we have been told is you... If you can get out of the facility, get out of the facility, just like you've learned in school. If you cannot and we're trapped, uh, you get down and stay low while the adults tackle the person is, is the instruction that, uh, that, uh, that most people give. Next one, if you would. First aid and allergies. Uh, we do have uh, uh, nurse nurses here. Uh, we do have an AED. That's that thing that shocks you to bring you back. And so uh, we, we won't use that on you unless we need to, right? If you gotta, don't, don't fake anything, right? We don't, we don't want to light you up like a Christmas tree just for the fun of it. Um, if you get a minor cut scrape, we have Band-Aids and, and all those things back there. Uh, we cannot give you medicine like Tylenol and all that unless you have a parent that could call and, and give us permission. Uh, food allergies, just to check. If you have food allergies and you have not talked to the folks in the kitchen, please let them know, uh, just in case. If it's, ooh, I don't like green beans, that's not a food allergy. Yeah, <laughs> Tristan's like, man, okay. Freed Hardeman, please uh, stand up. Where are you? Freed Hardeman, folks, thank you all so much for coming. Thank you for the pizza last night. Thank you for uh, bringing the ambassadors to sing today. We're looking so forward to that. And, um, to, yeah, that's going to be great. Plus the singing time this afternoon. You all can have a seat if you want. Thank you. Be sure and stop by their area back there. Uh, they are... Uh, they have uh, brought a lot of material. Fill out one of their cards to, to learn more about them. Uh, for the adults, we, have, we still have Gospel Advocates sent a lot of things for our youth leaders, um, uh, youth ministers. They sent uh, supplies down for their Horizon series. Also, I've got posters that, uh, that I've laid out some posters back there. If uh, any of the youth leaders want to take those back to the congregations, please grab those, take those with you today. Uh, don't take the ones hanging on the wall, just saying. What else we got, Chris? Uh, topics, we'll move on past that one. Oh, the prayer box, most important. Uh, if you have those prayer requests, uh, be sure and put those in the box uh, throughout the day and, uh, and, and text me back. That's good, Chris. Um, we do have a service project. <clears throat> this is going to be our third year. Last year, uh, we don't need those, Chris. We'll, that'll be for later. Uh, thanks. So what we'll do is in the past years, we started making these teddy bears. You all remember that? Who, have, who has done help with the teddy bears? Who's helped? Okay. So you know what that's like, and that fuzz is going to be all over us, and you, and you got to be real careful. you got to stuff it all the way in there. Miss Janet will guide you on that. Those teddy bears have become a big 
popular thing, not just, not just here, but it's, a, it's something other that I believe that we started that, that's, that's taken off. What do we do with the teddy bears? They go in the back of police cruisers. When they go up to um, a, a crime scene and there's some kid crying, they'll give the kid the teddy bear while they take care of the crime. Or the other thing that we do with them, we take them to the hospital and, and, give, them to, and give them to people. So those teddy bears are used greatly here. And last year, you all helped make a hundred of those. The big event that we like to make them for here is our first responder dinner when we bring the police in here and the first responders and give those teddy bears to them to take back. So hopefully this is a service project that you can take back to your congregation. After we do the group photo, um, we are going to divide into groups. I'm not going to tell you how to divide into groups yet. I'm just going to tell you why we're doing what we're doing. We used to let you pick what rooms to go to, and that sort of worked. If you notice, we're, we get a little cramped on facility here. So what we have to do is last year we brought everybody in the auditorium. You all did not like that, did you? No, no. You want to be in smaller rooms together. Got it. So we're going to do that, but that means we have to divide everybody up in groups of about uh, 30 to 40 evenly. <laughs> Brett, good luck with that. Brett is going to put a stamp on you, and then you're going to have guides. We're going to work that out. That We're going to work that mess out here in just a little bit. But for right now, we are. I think we're ready for a group photo. Anything else, Brett? Did I miss anything? Um, teachers this morning who are in here, some of them we don't, we don't have in here right now because they're upstairs, but we have Brian Mackinnon standing in the back who will be teaching Mike Johnson. There he is. He is smiling. He's going to play a, sing a camp song. Um, you, we also have, I'm forgetting my teachers. Brett Oaks is upstairs. We have, who else is up there? Greg Collins. And I'm missing Ben Wright. Not wrong, but Ben Wright. Where's Ben? Hey, Ben, how you doing? You're back with Paintsful. Man, you're moving around all the time. Let's do that picture, folks. So here's how it's going to work. Everybody stay in here. Does Steph have her camera, Brad, or are we just going to do it? Okay, great. We're going to, we are going to flood the stage. Uh, we're going to pile up as much as we can uh, on the stairs. We're going to move you around as fa and do this as fast as we can. Bear with us. So let's do it. 